hello, everybody. It's another episode of Dr. Jill Live. As you know, you can find us on YouTube, on Stitcher, on iTunes, or anywhere um, that you watch or listen to podcasts. And today we're back with my good friend, um, Bob Miller. Um, Many of you have seen our podcast and know Bob well. Um, We were just talking before we got on that your podcast episodes, Bob, are some of our most watched and favorite episodes. And what's interesting is we go really, really deep and really technical, but people seem to really like that. So hopefully if you're out there joining us today live or if you're listening to the recording, um, you will enjoy diving in. This is one of those podcasts I'll kind of give a little warning. You might want to watch it because Bob's going to share some slides or some very intense in very fun. I say intense, but you and I love the intensity of the diagrams, right? Exactly. (laughs) So we're going to, we're going to actually be having some visuals that you might want to tune in. So if you're listening in your car, um, you know, don't go off the road, but later on, if you get a chance, you might want to specifically watch this one on YouTube because there's going to be some cool graphics and things that might explain what I'll try to do is just add in. If you're out there listening and not watching, I'll try to explain if there's one or two things that need explanation. So Bob Miller, um, again, a uh, well-beloved guest and wonderful friend of mine. Um, he is a traditional naturopath specializing in the field of genetic specific nutrition. In 93, he opened Tree of Life practice and served as traditional naturopath for 27 years. Um, for the past several years, he's been engaged exclusively with functional nutritional genetic variants and related research, specializing in nutritional support for those with chronic Lyme disease. And I'll really say it goes way beyond that chronic infections, mass cell activation, even mold exposure, um, but definitely these complex chronic infections and toxins. And um, I could go on, Bob, you've got so many accolades, but what I love is your mind and what you bring to the table and the, how you look at things. So welcome to another episode. Always, always a pleasure to be here. And first, let me say congratulations on your book. What an incredible publication. And I know you must be impacting the lives of so many people as they read it. So uh, Best of luck in continuing to promote it and changing the lives as people learn some of the wisdom you're passing on. Oh, thank you, Bob. That means so much. Um, yeah, it's it's quite an ordeal, and I'm glad I'm on this side of it now getting it out there. Um, so today our topic is called a lesser known cause of mast cell activation. So many of you may know, I'll just frame this and then I'll give it right over to Bob. Mast cell activation, these primordial cells that have been around for probably for any of our other parts of the immune system, um, are often reactive to our environment. And so what we're seeing in this, you know, post-pandemic error and uh, error with an all-time high load of um, toxins in our environment. So parabens and phthalates in your makeup and beauty products, heavy metals, maybe when you get the silver amalgams in your mouth or uh, lead in the old paint, or as you, you know, sand off some old materials in your house, or now um, uh, fluorinated compounds, these PFAs are found in Colorado where I live and all of the water supplies are now contaminated with these forever chemicals. I could go on and on about the toxic load in our world, but the significance of this is that it's driving our immune systems to be a little crazy and to act out more than they are supposed to. So this toxic load plus infectious burden is a perfect storm that's causing us to see more and more and more cases of something we didn't even talk about 10 years ago called mast cell activation. So the topic of our conversation today is going to be to for Bob to really dive into some of the pathways behind this and explain something you may not have heard about relating to another cause of mast cell activation. So take it away, Bob. Okay, what a great introduction. I mean, you just gave a uh, like a two-hour class on mast cells in 45 seconds. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. So our topic here, and are you seeing the screen okay? Yes. Okay. So our topic is uh, lesser-known cause of mast cell activation. And uh, as Dr. Jill said, there's so many things impacting us. But today, I think we're going to take a really deep dive and look at what might be the mechanisms for all these environmental toxins causing this, but then more importantly, what we can do to maybe slow that process down a little bit. Now, there's a lot to be said about mast cells, and what we're going to be talking about is how they come from intracellular calcium, which probably is surprising many people. It's like, wait, calcium, that's supposed to be good. From something that probably no one has ever heard of, it's the aryl hydrocarbon receptor the NMDA receptor, and then, of course, the last one most people have heard about, and that's uh, EMF. And as we've said many times, this turns out to be the 3D chess game that's played underwater. Now, here's what we're going to talk about. Mass cells 101, and I mean just really basic, as Dr. Jill just explained it. But then we're really going to dig into some of the causes 
excess intracellular calcium. And we'll do a little bit on EMF. And then something very fascinating, the NMDA receptor stimulation and how glutamate's involved. Then we'll get into the aural hydrocarbon receptor causing this problem, which is absolutely fascinating. Then we're going to look at the various chemicals that stimulate this aryl hydrocarbon receptor, a little bit of genetic predispositions, and then an action plan of lifestyle, things you can do that may be able to slow down the possibility of uh, this happening. Now, we're going to be spending about two minutes on what mast cells are. One of the uh, the experts on mast cells is uh, Beth O'Hara, functional naturopath, and Dr. Jill has interviewed her twice. So if you really want to dig into the mast cells, really encourage you to go back and listen to uh, number 78, where they talk about mold, and, uh, and 29. Uh, both of those triggers and treatments for mast cells. So 43 minutes, 52 minutes, uh, mast cell 101 in case this is a new subject for you, because we're going to blow through it pretty quickly and then spend our time on, on why. Also have to do a shout out to a good friend, uh, Dr. Harold Landis. He graduated from University of Maryland Dental School in 83, and then he went on to do integrative medicine at the University of Arizona in 2021. And he and I have been, uh, we call each other the geezer geeks as we uh, as we get into all of this and uh, and study it together. And Dr. Landis is now participating in my webinars that I have for physicians uh, every other Thursday evening. So we're just having a good time. So I'd be uh, remiss if I didn't... Uh, mentioned his uh, valuable contribution to some of this uh, information. Okay, we're going to blow through mast cells here. Important role in innate and adaptive immunity. As Dr. Jill said, they recognize harmful antigens by binding to them. And then once they bind to it, it causes a release of inflammatory mediators. One of my favorite phrases is, is that a good thing? Yes, unless it isn't, meaning that if it's overactive. Again, it's very valuable innate and adaptive immunity, coordination of the immune, immune defense when we have a virus, bacteria, mold, candida, even venom detox, wound healing, recovery of connective tissue after injury, formation of new blood vessels and vasodilation, homeostasis of tissues and organs, neurogenesis, angiogenesis, regulation of menstruation, regulation of pregnancy, all these good things. However, we can get what's called mast cell activation syndrome where they're dysregulated. They become overactive and over-release inflammatory mediators. When, uh, when these slides were made up, which was some time ago, likely present in nine to 14% of the population, Dr. Jill, for the, for the people that come in to see you, again, which is, a, you know, you're seeing more of the tougher cases, what, what percentage would you say you think are having some level of mast cell activation? Yeah. You know, Bob, that's why I mentioned that 10 years ago, because 10 years ago, I didn't even know what it was. And nowadays I would say 25 to 30% have some piece of it. So it's a huge percentage. Um, and if you haven't watched, I know you didn't mention this today, Bob, but we did a presentation on the Carnahan reaction, the ionized pathway. And one thing I learned recently that I didn't know is mast cells are also regulated by nitric oxide, which if it's uncoupled when there's oxidative stress will actually cause more um, reactive oxygen and less mast cell regulation. So this is all connected. And if you haven't seen our previous episode on the INAS pathway, that's another one to watch. Absolutely. Yes, we named it after uh, Dr. Carnahan. They called the Carnahan reaction. Uh, here's a uh, brief look at a chart that shows how when the mast cells get activated, they give off histamine, some what are called interleukins. They stimulate a very powerful inflammation creator, tumor necrosis factor. And again, this is a good thing unless it's overactive. Now, mast cell activation is when things are getting carried away. And that began the evolution of discussions about other forms of mast cell disorders, which became known as mast cell activation syndrome. Now, when this occurs, we can have allergy, some subtypes of autism, asthma, anaphylaxis, gastrointestinal disorders, many types of malignancies, cardiovascular disease. Uh, they play a significant role in uh, TBIs, PTSD, Alzheimer's, MS, ischemic injuries. They might even be playing a role in autism spectrum disorder. Uh, they are really creating a lot of havoc. So what we had in our body to help us is now turning on us. Uh, eczema, chronic dermatitis, migraines, neurological disorders, GI, including Crohn's and IBD, some autoimmune diseases, vascular inflammation, 
unexplained multi-system illness. And I tend to think there's more people struggling with this than they um, than they realize. Would you agree with that? That uh, some people are chasing symptoms, not realizing it may be mast cell activation. Yeah, it's really, Bob, at the root of so, so many things. As you can see, this whole skew, it can be skin, it can be gut, it can be heart, it can be, and part of that's because histamine, one of the many mediators from mast cells affects every tissue in the body. Absolutely. And I'm not going to read all of these. You know, if you're watching the video, you can pause it if you want to look at it. But you can see it's widespread, all of the things that can be created by excess mast cells. Um, again, I'm not going to read this. If someone's watching, they may want to pause if they want to read it all. Uh, overall fatigue, muscular skeletal systems might be related to osteoporosis and osteopenia. Skin symptoms from the histamine, itching, flushing, hives. By the way, Dr. Jill and I did an excellent uh, podcast on histamine. And if you go back and look at that one, we really cover histamine quite well. Cardiovascular, feeling faint, digestive, mouth burning, gum inflammation. Again, I'm not going to read the whole list, but this is the who's who of digestive symptoms. Brain and nervous system uh, symptoms, lungs and respiratory symptoms, eye symptoms, trouble focusing, blurry, itchy, watery, irritated. Uh, reproductive system symptoms, endometriosis, painful periods, urinary tract issues. Uh, anaphylaxis, uh, itchy hives, flushing or pale skin. As you can see, this is a very, very broad list of things that can be happening. Uh, fibro, chronic fatigue, IC, certain cancers, as we said, Crohn's disease, Ehlers-Danlos, where people are uh, super flexible, uh, POTS, where you get dizzy when you stand up quickly, as we mentioned, autism, and even some forms of autoimmunity, such as rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Hashimoto's, the list goes on and on. All right, now, what's the real problem? As you so succinctly said in the very beginning, it's many of the toxins that we're exposed to. And it may even be an expression of what's called the cell danger response, where the cells go into somewhat of a, a shutdown. So we went along at a pretty good clip there because I just wanted to give a brief overview of mast cells. And again, go back and watch some of those other videos if you really want to dig into it. But we've now established that uh, mast cells can be a problem. Now we're going to dig into some new research as to why this might be happening. Probably pretty surprising that I'm going to be talking about calcium because everybody knows, well, calcium is important, right? It helps form your bones and teeth, helps maintain body strength, assists in the movement of muscles, assists with nerve messaging, helps blood flow as vessels relax and constrict, releases hormones and enzymes that support the body functions. We must have calcium. In the glands, it treasures the, uh, it triggers the uh, secretion. In nerve cells, triggers the release of neurotransmitters. In muscle cells, it triggers muscle contraction. In cardiac muscle, prolongs heart contraction to ensure adequate ejection of the blood. All really important things. You'll notice down here, I have the word unless. There's now convincing evidence that the calcium ion can play a critical role in cell killing under certain conditions. This peer-reviewed study, the calcium ion and cell death. Who would have thunk that something as important as calcium could actually, under the wrong conditions, turn on us? And what we're going to be talking about is when excess calcium comes into the intercell, the inner cell calcium, there needs to be a balance between the extracellular and the intracellular. And you need a lot extracellular, just a little bit intracellular. And when too much comes in, that's when we start creating problems. So here's a peer-reviewed study. It is well known that mast cell activation is critically regulated by intracellular calcium ion. Now, I don't want anybody listening to this and saying, oh my gosh, I've got to stay away from calcium because it causes mast cells. It's not what we're saying at all. We're saying it's when calcium is used improperly that we're going to explain in a little while. You know, we also did some, uh, some videos on iron. I mean, iron is critical. Without iron, life doesn't exist. It carries your oxygen through your red blood cells. However, iron can become a bad boy too and cause all kinds of problems. So now we're going to be exploring how the mechanisms are that cause calcium to be disrupted and actually do some harm rather than be 
good for you. Now, this chart here shows us, and I'm going to try to get the, uh, the annotation here and draw. Let me get the, the drawing tool. So here's what's called a calcium channel. So what you're seeing here is the, uh, is the cell wall, and there's channels where calcium comes in. And the key word here is if there's calcium overload, if there's too much inside the cell. So this is outside the cell over here. This is inside the cell here, the intracellular. Mitochondria dysfunction, oxidative stress, generation of free radicals, DNA damage, and cell death. If too much calcium comes intracellular, and again, we're not saying calcium is bad, but when it's misused and comes into the cell inappropriately, that's when it creates a problem. Now, this chart, uh, again, we're not going to go into the detail here, but it shows three different ways that this calcium flux can cause mast cell activation. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. And we have the citation here if anyone wants to, you know, look this up and read it. It's a long article. Somebody really wants to get into the specifics of how this causes the mast cell activation. So here's another article. If matrix calcium increases beyond physiological demands, it can promote the opening of the mitochondria permeability transition pore and trigger apotic or necrotic cell death. In other words, the cells can be killed if too much calcium comes inside the cell. Here's another article. The role of calcium in cell injury. And the, the bottom line is it can result in the membrane damage and mitochondria calcification and mast cell activation. So now the story is going, well, if that's the case, how does that occur? We're going to get into that. But first, let's look at, this has been linked to neurodegenerative disorders, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, even some thought that it might be related to autism spectrum disorder, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. I mean, if you talk to a, uh, an elementary school teacher who's been teaching for five years or more, and you ask them, how are the students doing? I don't know if that's happened to you as well, Dr. Jill, but everyone I've talked to says there's a difference in the last five years. The children can't pay attention. They're more rambunctious. Uh, they're more agitated. And at the worst, it can even go to uh, schizophrenia. Are you, uh, are you noticing that same thing in children, Dr. Jill? Yes. Hey, everybody. I just stopped by to let you know that my new book, Unexpected Finding Resilience Through Functional Medicine, Science, and Faith is now available for order wherever you purchase books. In this book, I share my own journey of overcoming life-threatening illness and the tools and tips and tricks and hope and resilience I found along the way. This book includes practical advice for things like cancer and Crohn's disease and other autoimmune conditions, infections like Lyme or Epstein-Barr and mold and biotoxin-related illness. What I really hope is that as you read this book, you find transformational wisdom for health and healing. If you want to get your own copy, stop by readunexpected.com. There you can also collect your free bonuses. So grab your copy today and begin your own transformational journey through functional medicine in finding resilience. Dr. Jill? Yes, yes. For a multitude of reasons, which some of which you already talked about, but absolutely. I feel like there's a big exponential difference in health, mental health of children and adults <laughs> and uh, all the things we're discussing. Absolutely. Okay, now we're looking at even heart failure. They're saying that mitochondrial calcium overload is a key determinant in heart failure. Now, here's one of the ways that this can happen. This Gene right here, CAC, NA1C. This is called your calcium voltage channel. And this line right here is the cell wall. And we need calcium to come in to the cell. We need some in there. It's stimulated by voltage. Now, what's happening to us? We are living in a sea of electromagnetic fields like never before. Uh, no, most, no matter where you go, in houses and businesses, uh, on the street with cell phones, we're being exposed to EMF. More and more research is looking at, is this EMF triggering this calcium voltage channel to bring calcium in? And that's an area that's being uh, researched quite a bit. 
Now we're gonna spend a little time on this chart right here that we made. It's just a little dense, but we're gonna slow her down here and show you what can, uh, can happen. Absolutely fascinated by this. There's something called the NMDA receptor. And there's a glutamate binding site. Now glutamate is a neurotransmitter that makes you intelligent, highly motivated, go-getter. Too much of it though, you're anxious. Glycine is an amino acid and it binds on here. And if there is too much stimulation of this NMDA receptor, look what it does. It brings in calcium into the cell. Again, this is the outer cell up here. This is the inner cell here, creating mast cells. Now, why might that be a problem? We're going to show you a little in a little while. Glyphosate, which is Roundup, will drive the NMDA receptor. And also homocysteine. This is something that I believe uh, should be measured more often than it, than it is. Uh, but it's a, uh, it's a molecule that needs to be recycled through a process called methylation into something called SAMI. And many times this homocysteine is too high and it will also stimulate the NMDA receptor. Now this gets a little bit more complex. Calcium, when it comes in, can be blocked by magnesium and many of us are low in magnesium. So you can see here, this little green right here is magnesium blocking it. Also the amino acid taurine will inhibit it. So that's why we've been looking quite a bit at uh, magnesium taurate, uh, perhaps, perhaps is the a good magnesium source when this is, uh, is an issue. Now, what's interesting, there's something called quinolytic acid. And we're, we're gonna have a slide for this, but it is neurotoxic and it will cause what's called uh, NMD, it'll cause uh, some lipid peroxidation, but it will also stimulate NMDA. And this comes from something called the kyronine pathway that we're gonna show you in a little bit later. Now, Dr. Jill, we have found a SNP that I've now put into my top 10 list. There's an enzyme called ACMSD, right? There's the RS number, okay. And that converts quinolinic acid into picolinic acid. And picolinic, we're gonna show you a slide, is quite helpful. And it's very much needed for the proper use of zinc. So if we don't have enough picolinic acid, and what I'm gonna show you, you can also have genetic mutations on the transport of zinc. So maybe if you don't get enough from your diet, you don't convert quinolinic to picolinic you don't get enough zinc, you have trouble carrying zinc. You do not have the ability to hold back this NMDA receptor. Mm. So as you can see here, there's multiple, multiple factors in, uh, involved here. So you've got to make sure this quinolinic acid isn't too high. And by the way, this, interestingly, this nasty molecule turns into something called NAD by these enzymes. And NAD actually inhibits mast cells. So Dr. Jill, that's why we're putting a lot of emphasis recently on making sure that this quinolinic acid isn't too high. And we are looking at, we're in the research phase now, we're not there yet. We've got to figure out how to get that quinolinic to come over to picolinic so that our zinc can hold this, uh, hold this back. This is so, a... Amazing, Bob. I want to comment on two little things that came up as you're talking. First of all, we've known for just cardiovascular disease in general, there's kind of four main nutrients I always think about for heart health. Magnesium is one, taurine is number two, then there's carnitine and CoQ10, but magtarate has always been a huge cardiovascular. And as we know from your slide just previous, um, this calcium channel is very important for cardiovascular disease and prevention and regulates blood pressure and all kinds of other things as well. So that's interesting that on this other level, this magnesium and taurine are so key. So that's number one. Number two is, as you mentioned, quinolinic acid is total excitotoxic. You'll probably talk more about this, but I'll just frame it from a clinical perspective. When I see elevated quinolinic acid in the urine, it is literally the number one red flag 
for neurodegeneration, for a bipolar, schizophrenia, ADHD, any sort of excitotoxic disease where there's a mental component or, or a nervous system component, because literally quinolinic acid elevated will kill nerve cells. And there's a whole nother pathway that's not shown here. Again, you'll probably show it to us that steals from our happy serotonin, right? Again, you know this well. So this is such an important pathway, Bob, that you're talking about. And I want our listeners to know that this is involved in a lot of depression, anxiety, um, uh, bipolar, um, mood disorders, and learning disorders, and neurodegeneration, because it literally elevated quinolinic acid will be so excitotoxic that it will kill your neurons and your brain cells. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to show a little later how it actually stimulates the uh, the inflammation. So um, this just shows the way we've got to be very careful with glyphosate, why we need to check our homocysteine and if it get it down. Um, this is why some people do not do well on glycine. And uh, and this is also why some people, as you said, are so, uh, so anxious. So we're looking at this NMDA receptor as being a big, uh, big problem. And again, we're, we're talking about mast cells, but as you pointed out, it's uh, way, way beyond that. Okay. Now, here we're saying that massive activation of the glutamate receptors that we just talked about can result in excessive rises in the calcium that's thought to underlie the fundamental processes leading to neuronal death. Preventing such cellular calcium rises in the brain may reduce considerably the neuronal damage either that's produced by stroke, head trauma, or epilepsy. Here again, another study. If anyone wants to, you know, read the whole study, just go to... Uh, to a search engine and just type in that title and that that will pop up the whole study. I just took like the one sentence that summarizes it. Excessive or prolonged exposure to glutamate causes an elevation of intracellular calcium levels that can ultimately trigger neuronal death. Now, I've been talking about glutamate probably for the last 15 years. From a standpoint of, yes, it makes you intelligent, highly motivated, go-getter, but it can make you anxious um, and it can, you know, lead to... Uh, you know, a little bit of uh, ADD, bipolar, schizophrenia. Only recently have we dug in and realized this is also a very powerful way to create inflammation inside the body. And uh, we'll be connecting those dots uh, a little bit later. So here they're saying just another study that says the activation of the NMDA receptors produces prolonged increases in that intracellular calcium concentration. All right, now, we're going to get just a wee bit deeper here. So you'll see on the right here, that's what you just saw. Okay. So we went uh, we went through all of that. Now what I'm going to talk about is glutamate. So right here is glutamate. Makes you intelligent, highly motivated, go-getter. Okay. And it's made from glutamine. And there are actually genes that uh, are enzymes that will cause the glutamine to turn into glutamate. Glutamate will go back into to glutamine. There's an enzyme called DAO that when there's mutations on it, it will cause the glutamate to go even higher. There's enzymes called GLUD and GOT that will turn glutamate into alpha ketoglutarate, which is energy inside the mitochondria. And you can have mutations on GLUD. You can have mutations on GOT. And one of the things, Dr. Joe, I'm very excited about recently is oxyacetate. This shows up in the Krebs cycle, and it takes glutamate and turns it into alpha-ketoglutarate. Now, this is surprising. Well, I mean, we just literally learned this in the last couple of months. Something called pyruvate turns into oxyacetate. And one of the B vitamins is biotin. And if you speak to most people about biotin, it's like, isn't that for the hair, the skin, the nails, you know, yeah, sort of. I've just begun to learn recently, biotin is much more important than we ever realized because the pyruvate carboxylase enzyme will take biotin and turn it into oxyacetate to clear the glutamate. So for some individuals, if you have a genetic mutation that you don't transport the biotin, that you don't recycle the biotin, that you don't use the biotin to turn the pyruvate, you're low on oxyacetate, which also impacts your, your Krebs cycle, but this glutamate is allowed to run wild. 
Well, and Bob, there's a, a product, I'm not going to mention brand names on here, but there's an oxyelacetate that I've been starting to use in clinical practice because it was talked about with the cell danger response, which is kind of related to mast cell activation. And the studies on this oxyelacetate using high doses can decrease that cell danger response and decrease mast cell activation. But I did not know this pathway. Like now that I see it, it's like an aha, because of course that works. Um, and of course you can do it with more biotin or pyruvate in the right person too. I'm sure you'll tell us about that, but this is fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm starting to use that product as well with very yeah. good. Results. Yes. You know, and guess who else on this call? I'm like, that would be like me has high glutamate. So ah, it, yeah, both you, <laughs> I know I'm like, I'm on this. <laughs> uh, <Love it. laughs> now what gets interesting then is that glutamate will stimulate the NMD receptor that we just uh -huh. talked about, but there's even more. Now, this really surprised me. So this line here is your cell wall. And there's something called lipids that have to replace the cell wall and build the cell wall. So as you all know, we're made of cells and we've got this cell wall and it's made up of, uh, from lipids, our, our fats. Well, what can happen is that iron and hydrogen peroxide, and by the way, this might be another podcast sometime just to dig into this, what's called ferroptosis it will damage this lipid. And if it joins the cell wall, it damages the cell wall. And I was hoping to have another graph made up, just couldn't get it done. But there's a dance between this damage to the cell wall and uh, the NMDA receptor and something that we're going to talk about later. Maybe that'll be our part two at some point. But what happens is when this lipid gets damaged, there's an enzyme called GSS that makes something called glutathione, and then an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase number four that takes the glutathione and fixes this guy so he can join the cell wall in a healthy way. It's called lipid peroxidation or ferroptosis. So you can see glutamine comes in, cysteine comes in, and you know, we, as you all know, the uh, glutathione is a tripeptide. So it's got uh, lysine, glutamine, and, ly and uh, glutamate. But interestingly, look at this key point right here. Glutamate inhibits the enzyme that brings the cysteine in to make the glutathione. Whoa. To me, that was a big deal. And then also cysteine, if it doesn't turn into glutathione, it can actually be inflammatory by especially if it can't go through what's called SUOX, and that'll actually make inflammation. So people might be taking cysteine like NAC, thinking, oh, cool, that's going to make me more glutathione. But if it's blocked and you might have problems with something called the SUOX enzyme that's you know downstream down here, you can actually make inflammation by taking NEC. Mm -hmm. when that happens. Bob, I love that you mentioned that. I just want to emphasize because, and a uh, quick question. Well, first of all, NAC is a precursor of cysteine. So everybody out there has probably heard of NAC. Many of you are taking it. And I would totally agree. Clinically, I have seen people get worse, usually when they have underlying infections, inflammation that's not controlled and too much NAC can be a problem. So be very aware. All these nutrients have their good sides and bad sides. I have a question that you may or may not have the answer to, but that alpha ketoglutaric acid or glutarate at the top left there, I see your arrows going from glutamate. So I'm assuming your body can convert glutamate to that. And that's a good pathway because that converts to energy. Does yes. taking alpha ketoglutarate do anything to the glutamate itself? Is there any back pathway that you know of? Well, I mean, I've never studied that, dug into it, but I mean, it would just make clinical sense that if you would take too much of it, it may cause the glutamate to back up. So, which, which you know, we've said this many times, you know, not too much, not too little of just about everything. Yeah. And then the other question real quick, lipid uh, membranes there. I'm assuming this could be measured with lipid peroxides, which we can measure in the urine and blood of patients. So yes, like that OGHD or something yep, like that. Yep. So if you have had done organic acids and you have high lipid peroxides, that's just a sign that your membranes are being damaged. And this is what Bob's talking about with that inflammation and the lipids being oxidized there at the bottom left. Yes. And, you know, when we get breakdown of the cell membrane, that's when the body breaks down. Because we live and die at the... Uh, at the cellular level. Yeah. So you can see now why I have a new appreciation for appreciation for glutamate, not just makes you anxious and gives you nightmares. It can actually do serious damage to the, uh, to the body. Any other thoughts, questions on this before I move on? Uh, 
Um, just one more caveat, if you're out there and you or a loved one has cancer, um, these pathways can be active in cancer, especially one thing I always look at if someone has cancer is, are they making lipid peroxides or 8-DH-DOH, um, which 8-deoxy, uh, I um, can't remember the full name there, but those two markers are um, related to oxidative stress and definitely related to DNA damage, which is a precursor of cancer. So this is relevant not only to inflammation, mast cell, but patients with cancer. Mm. Or let me talk about one of my other pet peeves. A lot of people think they have an upset intestinal tract, which they might. And too many times people reach for or suggested glutamine. I'm not anti-glutamine. It it does stimulate mTOR. It will rebuild the gut. But if you've already got this overactive, you can be throwing fuel on the fire by taking glutamine. And that can include things like bone broth, uh, Chinese food, collagen, uh, all of those things that we tend to think are good for us, like bone broth. Well, that can't be bad for you. Well, if you've got too much glutamate being made, in some instances, that could happen. Now, again, I'm not anti-bone broth. You know, it has a lot of benefits. But if this is an issue, maybe some caution is is warranted. Bob, I, I love that you said that because uh, one thing that you find on labels and health foods and different things is autolyzed yeast extract. It gets a great flavor in our brain. It's almost like a natural MSG. Um, and the same thing goes for that. That's a precursor of glutamate. And MSG is as well. MSG is glutamate. So anything with MSG, any, anything with autolyzed yeast extract, anything with collagen or bone broth, those things can trigger this pathway. Absolutely. Now, there's times that it's absolutely necessary. But if we're concerned that this guy is too upregulated, uh, caution might be uh, might be warranted. All right, quinolinic acid, and you did a good job uh, talking about how dangerous it is. It's an agonist, meaning it supports or stimulates that NMDR receptor. So it's a brain excitotoxin. Um, and they're saying it's a neurotoxin, gliotoxin, pro-inflammatory mediator, pro-oxidant molecule. It can alter the integrity and cohesion of the blood-brain barrier. How often, I know you do look at a lot of uh, organic acid tests. How often do you see that elevated, Dr. Jill? Uh, And I check pretty much every single person for this. It's on my organic acid panel. Um, I would say on this, it's probably 10 to 20%, which is still, you know, one or two in 10, Um, not as high as just the mass cell activation, but let's say even 10%. It's significant. And like I said, there's a few red flags in my practice that I see Um, And this is one of them that I'm like, oh, this is very bad. This will long-term lead to some sort of neurodegeneration, mood disorder, or some long-term sequelae. So it's a really big deal if you have this elevated. Absolutely. Uh, Just another that uh, kind of says the same thing, implicated in the uh, cause of many human neurological diseases. All right, now, picolinic acid. Now, if you remember back to my chart, I showed you there's an enzyme that turns quinolinic into picolinic. And um, I'm very intrigued by this because we found a study that when that one, that AMSSD that I showed you, when it's homozygous, a uh, much higher rate of depression and or even suicidal ideations. So that uh, quinolinic acid is really playing uh, havoc on us. And I think we found the one RS number that can really impact it. Now we're way early on this. But what I'm finding is in many autistic children, they have a homozygous on that one. They can't convert the quinolinic to to the picolinic. So on the other hand, picolinic comes from L-tryptophan that I'll show you in a little bit. And Bob, just repeat that gene real quick. I know you said it. I want to make sure people hear it. And then I heard it. The gene that converts uh, quinolinic to picolinic is what? ACS. Got it. D. Thank you. And there's the RS number, 2121337. And I didn't, I don't think I put that slide up, but uh, there is a slide that this is related to depression. Well, that would, that would certainly make sense. Yeah. So if anyone can check their genes for that, that's a good one to look at. So as I said, we're seeing that quite often in autistic children. Um, okay, now the, uh, okay, picolinic. Neuroprotective, immunological, antiproliferative effects Picolinic acid increases the turnover of zinc in addition to enhancing the absorption and excretion. So it has implications for uses in zinc deficiency. So think about how this becomes the perfect storm. If you don't turn your quinolinic into picolinic, you're going to stimulate the NMDA. Then you might be inhibiting the one mineral that calms it down. Perfect storm. Now, just 
clinical observation only. We're seeing many individuals who have difficulty converting quinlinic to picolinic along with trouble transporting zinc as almost like the perfect storm. So we've been uh, trying to put these people on a lot of uh, zinc picolinate. And Bob, interesting, I, there's a German researcher who's doing DNA addicts. What he's doing is he's testing your DNA for um, things that stick to the DNA and damage the DNA. That could be aspergillus, like mold. It could be metals. It could be uh, all kinds of chemicals and toxins. And he literally does a panel of the DNA for these adjuvants. But the core thing that he finds is low intracellular zinc is the thing that triggers the worst reactions, which goes back to probably this research here and why zinc is so core and so important for detox. Absolutely. I'm glad you pointed that out. That's very valuable. All right. Homocysteine, we mentioned this earlier, is known as an agonist. Again, that means it helps it. Antagonist means it goes against it to that NMDAR. So that's so important to keep your uh, homocysteine levels in check. And uh, I'm sure you check that, don't you, Dr. Jill? I do on every patient. And my ideal is below nine if you're healthy, below seven if you have neurodegenerative disease. Absolutely. And I'm surprised how many uh, doctors do not check it. It's uh, it's uh, often when you're, when we're consulting with folks, it's what's your homocysteine? I don't know. And uh, they, uh, I th there's a, there's a book out there called uh, the higher your homocysteine, the sooner you die from all causes. And we're going to show you uh, very briefly, another pathway that homocysteine can stimulate what's called uh, the, uh, the Fenton reaction where iron becomes a free radical. Okay, just another article here, homocysteine-dependent NMDA receptor stimulation and the resultant calcium influx leads to rapid and sustained phosphorylation. Um, glyphosate, again, peer-reviewed study. You can look these up. If you type all these words in, the whole thing will pop up. Our results strongly suggest that activation of the NMDAR pathway together with its downstream calcium is caused by glyphosate. Fructose modifies the NMDA receptors and can make uh, seizures worse. So what have we done in the last 40, 50 years? Uh, one of my, by the way, one of my favorite jokes is I was born in 1954. And when I'm speaking to younger people, I'll say, yeah, I was born on a different planet, meaning that we didn't have all of these things that we have today. So we have high fructose corn syrup. Then we have uh, the, the glyphosate. No wonder we're seeing so many people struggling and anxious. Now, this is the fascinating. It's called the arrow hydrocarbon receptor. Not many people have heard about this yet. And I think in the functional naturopathic world, we really need to dig into this because in my opinion, this is a big deal. Now, we're gonna, this is the, the cell, this is the cytosol, and this is the nucleus. A ligand is defined as any molecule or atom that binds to a receiving protein, otherwise known as a receptor. So here's a ligand. It attaches to the AHR enzyme. It then goes into the nucleus and it binds with something called ARNT. And hold on to your hat. Depending upon what the ligand is, it can be pro-inflammatory or it can be antioxidant. As you know, Dr. Jill, most enzymes that we look at, they can create free radicals or they'll create antioxidants. This one is a different animal. So I think you can see why I'm very uh, intrigued by this guy. Then there's another one called AHRR that will calm this down. Now we are really in the early stages of this. Now I know a lot of, uh, you know, holistic health practitioners uh, watch your videos and I'm just, my message to them would be, you need to start looking at this because this is a big deal. So what it does, a ligand here we're saying is defined as any molecule that binds to a receiving protein molecule and the arrow hydrocarbon receptor is ligand activated that takes in environmental, dietary, microbial, metabolic cues to control complex transitional programs. And when we say complex, this is still now being researched by the scientific community and data is coming out. I mean, there's so many papers being written on this. This is being looked at, but I'd like to bring attention to it, to the, uh, to the functional world, because I think it's a missing, missing piece. This is a little dense, but I do want to go through the whole thing slowly. 
It's a transcription factor and receptor for small molecule chemicals, including dioxins, environmental pollutants. Now, that you pointed that out very succinctly in your opening comments. But it will also take in things, things such as flavonoids, byproducts of intestinal microbiomes, and drugs. Now, once this um, ligation occurs, it translates to the nucleus. In other words, it goes into the nucleus. Then this big word here, the direct interaction between at least two different functional receptors forming a complex with specific biochemical and functional properties different from those of the component receptor unit. Boy, is that a mouthful. <laughs> but, uh, uh, with the AHR nuclear translocator uh, ARNT binds and regulates the expression of target genes. In other words, it will determine based upon what the ligand is, what it does. Now, one of the things that it turns on is CYP1A1 and CYP1A2 and 1B1. And that's called cytochrome P450 or phase one detox. Is that a good thing? Yes, unless it's excessive because what happens is this takes toxins, turns them into something that can be absolutely worse if it's not cleared by what's called phase two. So if your phase two enzymes are not doing their job properly and you start stimulating phase one, you can have a little bit of a problem. So the reactive oxygen species are generated during this process by these uh, cytochrome P450s, or this is so wild, antioxidants through NERF2. NERF2 is what turns on all your antioxidants. So you can be turning on more inflammation or anti-inflammatory. And there's also, to make it a little more complex, there's an aryl hydrocarbon receptor repressor, and we haven't even begun to dig into, dig into that. You know, might there be some ways to uh, to turn this on? So as you can see, this is incredibly complex. So perhaps someday when we have all of this down, we could do a uh, a whole podcast just on how this guy works. But look at this visual. If you get some dioxin or other bad chemicals, it'll stimulate the CYPs and make oxidative stress that does DNA damage and inflammatory cytokines. Or if the right flavonoids go in, it turns on NERF2, the master antioxidant, and has antioxidant properties. So, Jill, are you a little uh, surprised by how this one guy can do two different things? This is amazing, Bob. And I knew you told me there was some really cool thing you're going to share today. And once again, my mind is blown. <laughs> this is a, and, and you're right. I'm, I feel like I know a lot of what's going on. I have not studied this mechanism. So, Dr. Yeah, I think we really need to. I think those of us in the functional world really need to understand this because, well, as we'll talk about later, some of these nasty chemicals that we you know that we weren't exposed to 50 years ago is stimulating it. So here we are, these aryl hydrocarbon receptors, they control mast cells. That uh they result in calcium and reactive oxygen species dependent enhancement of mast cell activation. AHR is critical in controlling mast cell homeostasis. So I'm sure you're already in your mind thinking this through. So Bob, how do we not have it stimulated to the inflammatory side? And how do we stimulate more of the antioxidant side? And uh, we're getting to this a little bit, but again, this is uh, all brand new. And uh, we have a couple of clues, but we're going to be learning a lot more as we go along. So here's that EHR, and look what it's doing, stimulating the calcium channel to bring in calcium to combine with arachidonic acid, which is one nasty, nasty bad boy, and makes inflammation. And here again, this is just another chart. Here's the citation. If somebody wants to dig into the article, there's a whole article here, how EHR stimulates mast cells. Now, what's interesting is AHR wears two hats. It can stimulate interleukin-6, which is inflammatory, tumor necrosis factor. It can stimulate uh, IL-2 and IL-4. But look at this. It stimulates NQ01, which is anti-inflammatory, stimulates NERF-2, and again, stimulates that, uh, that CYPs. So it's amazing how this one uh, enzyme here 
can have all these different properties. So what I believe is happening, I mean, this was again, part of the, uh, the wonderful creation that the body is, and it works fine until we muck it up with all these environmental factors. So here's another slide that shows some of the things that will stimulate it. Vascular disturbances, impaired blood brain barrier integrity, neuroinflammation, neurotoxicity, immune suppression, circadian disturbances, oxidative stress, increased angiotensin II, that's what puts your blood pressure up, decreased nitric oxide, vascular inflammation, cellular sentinence, inhibition of autophagy, the cleaning of the cells, uh, messing up with our uh, circadian clocks. All of that can be affected by this AHR being out of whack. Sleep disorders, metabolic disorders, immune disturbances, decline in autophagy, decline in the mitochondria. And we spoke about these and also then, you know, bottom line decline in the lifespan as this gets over stimulated. Mm. I'm not going to well, read Bob, the... I want to mention really quick on that slide before there, that IDO enzyme, which is related to the quinolinic acid conversion. And years and years ago, when I, I was a big aha, probably 15 years ago in that IDO, because it converts kynurinate to quinolinic acid, which is our, we know the bad boy we just talked about. And there's many things that stimulate IDO enzyme, but one weird one that we haven't talked about, I want to mention is parasites. And oh, I have seen a correlation with um, parasite infestations and sleep disturbances. And as you mentioned here, this is to me is another aha today, because I'm like, oh, this might be the pathway or one of them by which parasites that you have in your intestines that you maybe don't know about is impairing your circadian rhythm and impairing your sleep. Absolutely. And I had some slides in here that I, that I took them out, but as you know, some research has been done at Stanford on how the, uh, the IDOL1, when stimulated by a tryptophan, goes along for a little bit and then it conks out. So if somebody has mutations in the IDO2, that can create something called metabolic trap. Uh, but I took those slides out because I thought we were getting into a little too much today. These are all the parts of the body. And again, I'm not going to read them for time, but I mean, it's the, just about everything can be affected when this AHR is out of whack. My summary there is the pizza's bad. If you, it looks like a slice of pizza, right? You got bad pizza there. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. Here's another map that I made that um, we're going to spend a little bit of time on. So uh, let me get the, uh, the drawing tool. So this is called the kyronine pathway where tryptophan and amino acid, we just, Dr. Joel just spoke about IDO1 and IDO2. They'll make something called kynurinine. And then it'll go through a whole nother process here where it ends up with your quinolinic acid. And there's that ACMSD. And then that eventually end up in NAD, which will calm down the mast cells. But for now, let's look at what happens when this kynurinine or any other substance stimulates AHR. And here's the one that suppresses it. This is where it combines and stimulates the RO hydrocarbon receptor. Now you'll notice that mycotoxins stimulate it. Arachidonic acid stimulates it. Now we're going to talk about polycystic aromatic hydrocarbons as well as homocysteine will all stimulate this receptor. And then what I did here, I just drew all the, uh, all the things that, that will happen, but it will stimulate interleukin-6. And we spoke about this, and I believe in our, uh, in our Ranty's uh, discussion, then stimulates the NOx enzyme, then stimulates KIT, which stimulates mast cells. But hang on to your hat, it also creates increase in intracellular calcium concentrations. And then as we spoke about earlier, here's the map that we showed earlier, how the glutamate through NMDA upregulation stimulates the problem. And then we could have EMF, voltage-gated calcium channel, creating this intracellular calcium. So there's a lot that can go wrong here. And then of course we show up here, the CYPs, you know, xenobotics, will be turned into carcinogenic uh, compounds. And I'm going to show you a little study later that upregulation of the RO hydrocarbon receptor can actually gain, can all cause weight gain. I'm sure many people have looked at crowd pictures from the 1960s. And if they look closely, it's like, there's not many people that are obese. You look at a picture today and, you know, 
Well, I don't know. Do you know the statistics of how many people are now obese, Dr. Jill? Oh, gosh. I, the, I think about diabetes, which is closely related, and it's like one in three, I think, is predicted or even currently. And I want you to just repeat what you just said about that body mass, just because I think this is such an important point today. Uh, is it the cytochromes that are, 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 just repeat what you just said there. I think it's so important. Oh, the cytochromes or the body mass gain? The body mass gain. You know what? I have a slide coming up. Okay, perfect. One, one or two slides, which, uh, which shows it in detail. So we have all these chemicals now, including kynerenine, and I didn't put them in here, but there's genetic mutations that can get the kynerenine stuck when we actually look at the map, because we're going to, Dr. Jill's going to be brave. We're going to look at this map in her again. So <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, we'll take a peek at her map. So uh, there's just so many things that stimulate this. Now, just very quick clinical observation. We are noticing that when people have mutations on here, they're very inflamed because we believe that even like the good flavonoids are not carried in to stimulate nerf 2 but that's just all speculative at uh, at this point but i think now everybody can see why we're uh, we're really excited about this uh, the potential for how we can alter this by what we're exposed to so here they're talking about that kynurenine promotes mast cell activation and what we're doing is we're we're talking about this guy right here and I probably should have put it in. There's enzymes here, genetic mutations you can have that you get stuck here. But you can see that kynurenine will promote mast cell activation through that RL hydrocarbon receptor. Um, here we go. This is what we were talking about. Kynurenine induced RL hydrocarbon receptor signaling in mice causes body mass gain, liver stenosis, and hyperglycemia. Isn't that astonishing? All right, then here's another one. Inhibition of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor prevents Western diet-induced obesity. So this may be the key as to why everyone's gaining so much weight. Uh, I mean, it's diet and it's lack of exercise and many things, but this could certainly be a, uh, a factor. So you can see that this leads to the, uh, to the obesity. So this study showed that inhibition of the EHR blocks the cycle's output to prevent obesity. Again, if anyone wants to read the whole article, just type that in on Google and up will pop the entire article with all of this if anyone wants to really dig in and uh, and learn more. Anything else on that, Dr. Jill? Uh, oh, your microphone's off. There you go. Sorry, I got the tool got all hooked up there and <laughs> tangled. Okay, all I was going to say is this makes so much sense. As we started with toxic load, increased in obesity, this is one of the mechanisms you just described as far as how all these chemicals in our environment are contributing, even if you're eating the same thing, exercising the same amount, to the increase in body weight gain, fatty liver, and obesity. Absolutely. So, the gut microbiota activates through the tryptophan metabolite canerinine to mediate. Uh, in this case, we're talking about uh, some, uh, some kidney cancers. But we need to really dig into this because tryptophan can turn into something called tryptamine that stimulates the RO hydrocarbon. So we, uh, we'd like to see if we can find maybe some probiotics that would inhibit that. But that's, uh, that's research for, uh, for another day. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, but polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAHs. They're made whenever substances are burned. Coal gas sites, breathing smoke are coming into contact with contaminated soil, exposes us to this. Now, what's been happening, I don't know if, uh, if that's happening in your neck of the woods, but here in Pennsylvania, we really got impacted by those uh, California, or the, uh, the Canada, rather, uh, forest fires. Uh, I don't know, I guess you weren't affected by that in the, Colorado, were you? Slightly, but we have our own, you know, so many fires last year. It's just starting this year. And of course, we're they're recording this just days after the beautiful town of Lahaina in Maui was burned to the ground. So I know they're experiencing and our love and prayers go out to all those people in Hawaii who've lost homes. But I want to mention something really important. We think mold is bad. And I test um, the labs like TGF beta and things after mold exposure. After the forest fires here and the wildfires here in Colorado, I was seeing the lab values actually much, much worse from the smoke and fire exposure than even from mold exposure. So I have actually seen objective data 
that this inhalation of smoke is as bad or worse as a mold exposure for most of my patients. Absolutely. Uh, this is the names of them. And if somebody wants them, they can, you know, pause the video and get them. But they're found throughout the environment in the air, water, and the soil. They can persist for months or years. PAHs, short for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Numerous carbon atoms join together. There's at least 10,000 difference of them. They can come from animal matter, carbon fuels, such as coal or petroleum. Uh, they can come from the sooty parts of smoke or ash, automobile exhaust, industrial emissions, smoke from burning wood, charcoal, and tobacco. Interestingly, grilled, smoked, and charbroiled foods are a source of some PAH exposure. And here's an article that's saying that the... Uh, they're, they're created by incomplete combustion, and uh, they induce the uh, cytochrome P450s that we just talked about through activating the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. All right, now off to dioxins. Again, through the activation of the aryl hydrocarbon receptor, are potent toxic substances wildly distributed in the environment. So this could be doing it uh, as well. They're often harmful to human health. They're sometimes called persistent organic pollutants because they take many years to break down. Some of this even comes from food, animal products, dairy, meat, and seafood. It can get into the drinking water. According to the EPA, it can come from different sources. It's mainly the result of industrial processes. And the EPA has listed dioxin as one of the 30 hazardous air pollutants that pose the greatest threat to urban areas. And this chart shows how the dioxins come into the cell, they combine with the AHR, then with the RNT, and stimulate reactive oxygen species through cytochrome P450. High levels of dioxin is in uh, cigarette smoke. So this might be one of the mechanisms that uh, cigarette smoking can be so, uh, so bad for us. And, you know, we're stating the obvious. So if you're a smoker, a really good idea not to. Now, I just put this in for fun. Uh, this is my office, and I just snapped these pictures. In my office, if you'd be sitting in my office, I have something with a carbon filter, something called Molecule. And by the way, this is not a promotion for them at all by any stretch. There's lots of them out there. And a Dyson. So I just mentioned when, when people come in my office, they, they look around, it's like, you've got three air purifiers? Uh, yep, that's uh, is the door coming in. This is next to my desk. This is a little countertop. So. Bob, I have three in my 1,400 square foot condo and I have five in my office. So I totally <laughs> am right there with you. <laughs> uh, yes. All right. Uh, this should suggest that AHR has tumor suppressor like activity for human lung cancer. So, in other words, this guy isn't all bad, but arsenic can throw a monkey wrench into it. And again, we're getting arsenic from. Uh, I believe we can get that from chicken and rice, if I'm not mistaken. So, uh, again, homocysteine activates the AHR pathway. I am uh, really becoming fascinated with arachidonic acid. Uh, this is one bad boy. And it actually plays an important role inside the cell membrane. And I'm going to show you a little chart, and this could be another, uh, another topic to discuss. The genetic and epigenetic patterns that causes arachidonic acid to come outside of the body. But the bottom line is it will stimulate the AHR from the, uh, from the arachidonic acid. This is a, uh, a test called uh, your omega, uh, it's an omega-3 index. And this shows your uh, omega-3s. And you can see from this individual, it's low in the red. This is the omega-6 to 3 ratio. It's high. And here you can see the arachidonic acid EP ratio high. And we are seeing individuals, you can see this goes up to 32.1 and it should be 2.5 to 11. I'm seeing this in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in some individuals. It's, uh, and I believe it's one of the bad boys that's really creating a lot of uh, problems. Now, just very briefly, we'll show how we can get arachidonic acid. And we spoke about this. If somebody's really interested, we, we did the... Uh, the video a couple months ago on Rantes, and we talked about the tumor necrosis factor. And by the way, this is held back by something called heme oxygenase. So if you get a chance, 
watch the video Dr. Jill and I did on um, heme oxygenase because that holds this back. Mycotoxins, virus, clostridia, Borrelia, lipopolysaccharides stimulate TNFA. You can also have genetic issues where the TNFA is overactive. It'll stimulate an enzyme called PLA2 that pulls arachidonic acid out of the cell membrane. And then here's where it does its damage. You can create histamine. You can go through COX-2 and make pain and fever. This is the one I'm very intrigued with that we'll have to talk about it another time through 12 locks in a process called ferroptosis or through COX-1 and make something called thromboxane, which can make your, uh, uh, can activate your platelets and make your uh, blood uh, too thick. So that's why I'm very intrigued by arachidonic acid. And as we said, it, it stimulates that aryl hydrocarbon receptor, but it's also responsible in a process called ferroptosis, where, uh, where iron combines with the arachidonic acid to again uh, damage the, uh, the lipid membranes. You spoke about this brilliantly in the, in the opening, aflatoxins and mycotoxins stimulate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. The uh, Endocrine disrupting potential of pesticides will stimulate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Uh, now, these they're talking about hepcidin deficiency, which results in iron overloading and heme accumulation, again, promotes the AHR mediated oxidative stress. So, again, iron critical. I mean, we didn't have iron, life wouldn't exist, but in excess or used improperly, in addition to doing some other things, it promotes this AHR enzyme. We all know lead is not good for us. So this is another one that lead will stimulate the AHR and the CYP1A1 to create more inflammation. And as we all know, you know, many years ago, uh, we had lead in our paint, lead in our gasoline. And so lead toxicity is a, is a huge problem. I would imagine uh, I don't know if you do it with everyone, but you probably do some testing for lead, I would imagine, Dr. Jill. I do. At some point, I test everyone for lead as well. Yes. How prevalent is it? Uh, you know, I think less than when we didn't know about the chip. We know that a chipping of paints and things are, you know, a big issue, but I think it's less of an issue than it used to be, but I still see it. Absolutely. Mercury stimulates this process. So this is, I mean, anyone who's in functional medicine, you know, knows this is the who, who of bad things. Who are now learning one of the effects that it might be having by stimulating this aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Now, here's an interesting chart that we kind of sort of saw before, but this pulls it together a little more effectively. So here's um, here's tryptophan, an amino acid, and it needs to turn down into serotonin, and then it'll actually also turn into melatonin, which we need for sleep. There's a substance called BH4 which is needed to turn that tryptophan into serotonin, it's also needed to make nitric oxide. So I'd encourage you to go watch the, uh, the video that Dr. Jill and I did on INOS and the Carnahan reaction, where we looked at how what's called the NOS2 enzyme can be overactive and chew up your BH4. So if you chew up that BH4, you're going to be slightly depressed, and then you may have more too much tryptophan. Well, that tryptophan through IDO1 and IDO2 comes down through here, makes kynerenine. And if you remember earlier, we talked about how that can stimulate the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. There is one evidence-based SNP. I don't have the SNP number here, but it will cause things to be blocked right here. So we don't go down this pathway and make something called NAD. And we're also finding there's some mutations on this KYNU that also put the brakes on so we don't get down to this. In case anyone doesn't know, NAD is critical for life. Uh, it makes its part of energy production inside the cell. It's responsible for making NADPH. And I think we, I think Dr. Joe, we did a video on NAD and NADPH and the NADPH steel. So if we don't get enough of this, we have a problem. We can also have genetic mutations on QPRT and MNAT that we don't get enough uh, NAD. Well, the NAD suppresses the mast cells. 
So you can see how this kernine pathway and this whole pathway is becoming uh, so important. We just, uh, I don't think we put enough emphasis on it in the um, in the functional uh, functional world. And here you can see NAD boosting molecules suppress mast cell degranulation. So you can see if you go back to this this map here, if we get clogged up right here, not only do we stimulate the arrow hydrocarbon receptor that makes more inflammation in mast cells, but we don't have the NAD that helps knock it down. That's why we're beginning to believe this pathway is so, so vitally important. Resveratrol has antagonistic activity on the arrow hydrocarbon receptor. So it may even help with the dioxin toxicity. Now, this is totally fascinating. Vitamin B12, and they're saying folic acid, but they, they probably mean folate, alleviate the symptoms of nutritional deficiency by antagonizing or against the arrow hydrocarbon receptor. So what they're saying is that only these two substances, B12 and folate, will actually slow down that, that arrow hydrocarbon receptor. So you can also have genetic mutations that I'll show in a couple minutes here that you may not transport your folate or you may not transport your B12. Then if you add to that dioxin exposure or those other environmental toxins, you've created the perfect storm. We've talked about this many times. Hydrogen, number one, periodic table of elements. Um, and there's tablets that you can drop in a glass of water and they fizz. And I know both you and I are big fans of that. And I know you also uh, breathe hydrogen as well. So who would have thought that lowly hydrogen, number one on the periodic table of elements, will slow down that arrow hydrocarbon receptor? Artichoke, who would have thought? Artichoke has something in it that induces through AHR the nerf to the good side of it. So we're going to be learning so much more about this. And I'm sure we're going to, as research goes on, there's more things that are going to, uh, to come to us. But artichokes upregulates nerf 2 That's what turns on all your antioxidants. One of my favorite enzymes, NQ01, which neutralizes superoxide and also helps properly use uh, NAD. So here they're saying that it's activating it, but it's activating it in the antioxidant side. So it all depends what goes in, what it does. Milk thistle prevents the expression of the CYP1A1 and COX2, which are genes targeted by the aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Indole 3 carbonyl. It will actually also slow this down. It diminished the lipopolysaccharide-induced pro-inflammatory gene expression of INOS, many of these others, and it slows down the um, aryl hydrocarbon receptor. Rosemary inhibits activation by dioxin. So if you're exposed to dioxin, the gentle little herb rosemary can help you out. A lot to be learned. So I kind of summarized what you can do. Try to limit exposure to dioxins and PAHs. Consider high-grade air purifiers. If you're smoking, for gosh sakes, stop. <laughs> Work with your doctor on homocysteine and uh, make sure that's okay. Um, make sure you have healthy levels of omega-3, 6, and arachidonic acid. Uh, make sure you don't get exposed to lead, arsenic, or mercury. Uh, try to eliminate exposure to mold and mycotoxins. And Dr. Gio has lots of uh, videos on mycotoxins. Um, and if you are filled with mycotoxins, work with a qualified health professional if needed. Might be a good idea to measure the quinolinic and tyranine levels in the organic acid testing. And again, work with a qualified health professional to normalize about a balance. Make sure your phase two detox pathways are working. Uh, make sure you have adequate levels of folate and B12, but you've got to be cautious. We've talked about this before. Too much folate can stimulate histamine. Consider hydrogen water, indole 3 carbonyl, milk thistle, resveratrol, and artichokes. And if you really want to go deep, look at functional genomic testing to see if any of those things are there. Now, again, we're not giving any medical advice here. This is just for educational, informational purposes. But for those who want to know how you can lower the risk of that overactive AHR, there's some, uh, some common things that just, uh, you know, everybody knows makes sense. But this would be the uh, some of the things to uh, 
to look at. So anything to add to that, uh, Dr. Jill? No, um, fascinating. And what a wonderful list. Um, one thing you mentioned with B12 and folate, we know that homocysteine stimulates B12 and folate lower homocysteine. So I wonder if that may be just related to lowering homocysteine, who knows, but. Yeah, we, we don't know it. It very well, uh, it very well may. So what we're going to do now, uh, we're going to very briefly look under the hood of Dr. Jill, who's very brave. <laughs> I'm the gonna... guinea pig for health. So I, I'll put <laughs> my yeah, genes to science here. <laughs> yes. So here is a map of Dr. Jill's data. Now, when we click on any of these here, it will show up. So very briefly, extremely briefly, I want to encourage you to go back and watch the video we talked about, the Carnahan reaction. Because there's an enzyme called NOS2, when it's upregulated, will cause you to make too much nitric oxide that can be damaging and deplete your BH4. And Dr. Jill, both mother and father gave her mutation on two of the genes that cause this to be upregulated. And that's why we call it the Carnahan reaction. Uh, because everyone knows Dr. Jill's uh, health history and how she struggled. I'm sure this wasn't all of it, but this had to be a piece of it. So that depletes your uh, your BH4. And by the way, another topic for another time, but ferroptosis. So it depletes our BH4. You can actually have genetic mutations that you don't make enough BH4. But now let's go up here. So, and actually, Dr. Jill, you're, uh, you're in pretty good shape up here. So you don't have the, the one enzyme that degrades tryptophan. So if someone doesn't degrade excess tryptophan, they can actually have extra. Here's that IDO2. You do have a homozygous on one of them. And you can see here, it's not that all uncommon. It occurs in 25% of the population, but it's called the metabolic trap where IDO1, if it gets pushed, it works. And then all of a sudden it just kind of conks out stops working. So if we have mutations on IDO2, we may not come down this pathway to make our, uh, our NAD. Now, there's nothing evidence-based here, but there's a couple that are uh, slightly out of whack here, but I don't think that's serious. So here's your carnirinine. And then you are a clear sailing. I mean, look at all that green. I mean, there's not a thing that went wrong. All oh, it's uh, highly unusual to see somebody that looks that good. So this is the uh, the one that we talked about, the uh, the one ending in 37. This is, I'm going to put this on my top 10 list of SNPs that are dangerous, that inhibits your body's ability to take quinolinic into uh, to picolinic. So we'll go back up here. If that picolinic is high, we show how that'll stimulate the NMDA receptor site. And as I mentioned, if somebody's got that one, plus if they have difficulty controlling zinc, and you can see here, Dr. Jill, you're perfect on your zinc transport. No problems there whatsoever. Uh, obviously, everybody knows you're, you're brilliant. Uh, so there's genes called GRIN, and you don't have the ones that are considered pathological, but you've got a few SNPs here that could increase your NMDA, increase your glutamate a little bit. We spoke earlier about the uh, oxyoacetate, and you do have an interesting mutation on the gene that uh, that causes you to uh, recycle your biotin into biocytin. And you can see here, this only occurs in 4.3% uh, of, uh, of the population. So that's why it'd probably be a good idea for you to take uh, biotin. But you can see you don't have any other serious issues other than you might make a little more glutamate, which again, no surprise. Uh, because you are one of the more brilliant functional doctors in in the United States, and that's why, because you got a little bit of extra glutamate there. And then when we dig into your uh, aryl hydrocarbon receptor, really non-event here. I mean, you don't have uh, hardly anything on, on the enzyme itself, just clinical observation. When people have a lot of mutations on the ARNT, Many times they're not bringing it in here and they don't have the antioxidant capacity. So, but you're clean as a whistle here. Uh, if we do make some interleukin-6, uh, you could have a slightly over, uh, overactive uh, interleukin-6. You do have one of the kit genes that, you know, if stimulated, mast cells could get carried away uh, a little bit. 
And then what we did is uh, remember I said that um, B12 and folate is necessary to calm this down. So what we put in here, we put in the whole, well, not the whole, just an abbreviated methylation. And you do have one little copy of a folate transporter, DHFR, MTHFR C677. So maybe a little bit of folate would be a good idea. You know, again, not pushing the histamine. Um, and then interestingly on your B12, there's something called gastrointrinsic factor. That's the absorption of B12. The transport of B12, you've got a homozygous here. And the uh, the MTRR that puts the uh, the methyl group. So possibly a little bit of B12 and folate you know, could be beneficial, but we got to be real cautious because as we said, that folate can stimulate uh, histamine. And you and I have talked about that, that people get a home test and it's like, oh my God, I got MTHFR. And they start taking three to five milligrams of methylfolate. Right, right. They feel great for 10 days followed by what the heck just happened to me. Yes. Because they've pushed it uh, too hard. And that makes so much sense always when we talk because I've been on injectable B12 since my Crohn's and my cancer because I was severely deficient before I ever knew any of this 20 years ago. And I do so well, but I need my B12. And it always was the same thing with the methylfolate. And this is the same with patients. I always want to replete B12 before methylfolate because if you overdo the methylfolate and you have a deficiency of B12, things get way worse. And this was the case for me because years ago, right after the breast cancer, I realized, oh, folic acid, anti-cancer at that point. And it would made me very, very ill to take the high dose folic acid, just like what you're describing. And I should say methylfolate was the one I took. But for mm -hmm. years, that B12 has been critical. I think it was probably a small contribution to my cancer and Crohn's, just the severe deficiency. And then you mentioned biotin. I've been on that for years and intuitively have known there's something important beyond hair, skin, and nails. And you just told me recently about that pathway and that biotin gene, and it makes so much sense. Sure. And just to reiterate, this is where we need that oxyacetate mm -hmm. that turns that glutamate into alpha clitor. And we're just, again, clinically observing, just observing Biotin can help some people with anxiety mm -hmm. if they've got if they've got high glutamate and if they may need to turn some of that glutamate into alpha ketoglutarate. glutarate. So we can't say that biotin's anti-anxiety. I think that's where we we get into trouble. We we try to pin a nutrient to a condition, and somebody can be anxious. And if this isn't the issue, biotin won't hurt, but it won't help. So that's why we have to get into precision care, mm -hmm. where we see exactly where the uh, where the, the need is. So Dr. Joel, although you didn't do too well on the, uh, the nitric oxide side, um, as we pointed out uh, over here, you know, you had a little trouble over here. Uh, you were better than most. Uh, very rarely do I see anybody who's got, you know, clear sailing all the way down through here. So, um, so just some typical things like avoiding some of those toxins, a little bit of B12 and biotin like you're doing would uh, probably be um, all you need. So uh, so there you go. So thanks for being brave and letting everybody uh, see. You. You're welcome. Hopefully um, you are listening out there, getting some of these great information. You're probably like me going to want to watch this again. Bobby, you give us such great information. Um, and tell us where we can get more about what you're doing, where we can find you, sure, give us sure. that information. Yeah. So if, if now this is, this slide is for health professionals. So if you're a health professional and would like to look at the genetic information, uh, we have software called functional genomic analysis that creates that map that you just saw. We have supplements. And then we also have a saliva test, of course, that measures the, uh, the DNA. So if you're a health professional and you find this interesting, just go to functionalgenomicanalysis.com get a free trial of the uh, software. Um, we also have an online certification course that talks people through, it's like 24 hours of instruction to learn it all. First three modules are free. If you're not a health professional and you just want to listen to it just for fun, you certainly can. I mean, there's no certification or anything, but a lot of you know lay people just say, this sounds cool, I want to learn it. If someone wants to go on a certification, if you use the Dr. Jill coupon, save $100, it's only $5.95, save $100. Um, and again, this, uh, you know, if you don't have some health degree, this doesn't, uh, you can't just a lay person can't get this and then start practicing. This is for the person who's uh, already qualified to just add that, uh, add that uh, to it. And if someone wants to talk to us, uh, Tria Life Health, T-O-L health.com, we still do uh, 
consulting, although I've now been told I'm booking out to uh, November. But uh, we're still taking on uh, new folks to uh, to try to help them. So there is our uh, information that uh, if you want to go to our website, give us a call. And again, health professionals can uh, can go here. So I think uh, that is the uh, the end of the uh, the presentation. Let me find how to stop the sharing. There it is. Awesome. Bob, as always, what a great tour de force of a new round of the aero hydrocarbons. I can't wait to continue diving in. And I'm sure we'll be doing this again in a few months on the next level. Thanks for all the work that you do in the world. Thanks for the brilliance you bring. Thank you all for listening. Um, again, you might want to go back and watch this one again. If you were listening on audio, you might want to watch the actual video on YouTube. Um, and all the things we mentioned with basic like methylated bees, um, oxalate. I'm going to put links to uh, places where you might find some of those things and products if you're interested. Um, Bob, thanks again for joining us today. It was a lot of fun. Did I, uh, was my promise true that this would be fascinating? It was fascinating. I loved it. <laughs> thanks so much. And thank you everybody for joining us.